if not, I can. I've, I've made Phil a co-host, uh, uh, and so uh, we'll turn it over here and him just a second. I will have to say, I do have the Laney's beat on location. Jaquita, I'm actually at the truck wash at the head of Jack Kelly Holler, if that helps. Uh, so I have beat you on that one tonight. <laughs> That pixelated kind of funny, Jeremy. It it looked like it was an artistic rendering of a picture instead of the actual picture or the video. I'm recording, so. Okay, uh, I think we've got our speaker on here tonight. Uh... If everybody will mute except for, I think he's under, I think it's under David. Uh, David Owen, are you all on there? Yeah, we're here. Okay. Hey, Owen. Hey, how are you? Good. Good deal. Good deal. Glad to have you on here tonight. Tonight, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about basics first day. Uh, appreciate everybody coming in and joining us tonight. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Owen Petrie. And Owen is with Lifeguard Ambulance Service, a division of AMR. And they serve, uh, they serve us here in Harlan County, but they serve uh, uh, several areas uh, across the country. They're one of the largest, uh, I've learned they're one of the largest ambulatory services in the United States, if not the largest. So, uh, uh, but uh, tonight we're, I'm tickled to death to have Owen in here to, to help us out and give us some, some basic first aid. I Take it that you don't have a PowerPoint that you're going to information to us. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm going to keep on the hip here. With okay. You. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead, Owen, and turn it over to you. And uh, without further ado, Mr. Owen Petrie. Uh, guys, my name's Owen Petrie. Uh, I'm an advanced EMT with uh, Lifeguard Ambulance Service, and uh, as I said, there uh, we are. Uh, subdivision of AMR, who's a subdivision of Global Medical Response, which is one of the largest uh, emergency medical services in actually the world, uh, when you go as far as that. Uh, we provide 24-7 uh, emergency medical services to uh, where I work at, the residents of Harlan County, and, uh, you know, we uh, try to get out in the public and do some uh, PR stuff and education stuff as far as First aid, uh, stop the bleed. I'm sure some of you guys are uh, familiar with uh, stuff like that. Uh, I've been in EMS since uh, 2013. Started as an EMT at Harlan EMS and uh, been in the fire service since 2001. So I've been in this stuff for a long time. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk a little bit about basic first aid and, uh, you know, being prepared for the, you know, unfortunately the inevitable of you know, what could happen as far as somebody getting injured or having some type of illness and how we're going to deal with that, uh, you know, from day to day, but not only that, but in the event of an emergency, you know, it's, it's always important to be prepared. Uh, I had some stuff that I was going to bring with me, but unfortunately, uh, I'm actually on shift today. So I got kind of tied up at the last minute and didn't get to bring my stuff that I was gonna bring as far as some example first aid kits that I had put together. Uh, but it's very important to have this stuff, not only in your home, but you know, in your car, or if you're gonna be up in the woods, having something up there as well. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about building first aid kits and, uh, or you know, buying, going out to Walmart and buying, you know, pre-made first aid kits. Uh, those things are great too. Uh, but one of the most important things that we can carry with us in these first aid kits is stuff to control bleeding. Uh, you know, we only got so much blood in our bodies and, uh, you know, it's very important to be able to stop that. So, you know, when we talk about first aid kits, you know, we think about things such as, you know, band-aids, uh, you know, insect bite, medications, uh, you know, Tylenol, stuff like that. But I kind of want to talk more into the, you know, actual, you may have to use it in an emergency. So bleeding control is a big thing. So, you know, we want to make sure that we've got some uh, bulky bandages, stuff like that in there, uh, you know, as well as stuff as simple as band-aids as well. 
But, uh, you know, one thing that we don't carry a lot of times in first aid kits that I think is very important is a tourniquet. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they talk about, uh, you know, using belts as tourniquets, and, and I'm sure in a pinch that works just fine, but uh, belts really don't get as tight as, uh, you know, we would like them to, because you got to think we're trying to stop the circulation uh, because we're dealing with an arterial bleed with tourniquets. So, you know, my advice is to, you know, have something you can make a makeshift tourniquet with, such as a couple triangular bandages and a stick, which we can pick up anywhere or an ink pen, or, you know, going and buying one commercially from, you know, amazon.com or somewhere like that, uh, just a real good place to, to get that kind of stuff. Uh, but a tourniquet can actually mean the difference between life or death, whether we, uh, you know, think about it or not, because you got to think when we have something like an artery that is punctured or severed, uh, you've only got minutes uh, before you bleed out. And uh, so one thing that I always tell people as far as, you know, when they're building these first aid kits is, you know, buy them a tourniquet. You may never have to use it. And a good tourniquet will cost you anywhere between 25 and 30 bucks for a good one. And, uh, you know, you just can't put somebody's life on uh, 25 to 30 bucks. You may never use it, like I said before, but it's very important that we have stuff like that to be able to stop that bleeding. Um, you know, whether it be like at a car wreck that you roll up on or, you know, a uh, an accident that's happened, such as a tree falling through the window and that glass severing an artery or something like that. So, you know, when we talk about building a first aid kit, a tourniquet is usually one of the first things that I try to tell people that they need to add to that kit. Um, it's it's very important life-saving piece of equipment. Now, bandages, you know, you can go out to Walmart and, and pick up some four by four bandages and uh, what they call roller gauze, which is a big roll of gauze. And, you know, you can wrap it around to secure that bandage. Uh, but another thing that we talk about in Stop the Bleed class, uh, which if you haven't ever attended one of those classes, it's a very informative life-saving class that, you know, I really can't, uh, you know, put out there enough for people to take because, I mean, it's, uh, it actually does save lives. I've had people that's taken the first or Stop the Bleed class and, uh, you know, they've used that information to save a life. And uh, it always does my heart good to hear people tell their stories of these classes that they went to and, and be able to save a life because of it. So if you guys ever get the opportunity to take a class like that, not only is that going to help you on, you know, knowing what to do in these types of emergencies, but it's also going to uh, better prepare you to build a good, solid first aid kit. Um, so, you know, that's something else we want to add in there is, you know, some bulky dressings and stuff like that. Uh, another thing I usually tell people to throw in there is maybe a, a, a bottle of Tylenol, not only for its, uh, you know, being able to fix, you know, the pain situation, but, you know, sometimes in these natural disasters that we have, it may be 48 hours before you're able to get out of home if you have to shelter in place or something like that. And it's very easy for somebody, especially this day and time, to develop a fever. So that's another thing that uh, I think is important to have in your first day kit is something that can, you know, break a fever uh, and or help you with some type of pain uh, on that. And then, uh, you know, all the little odds and ends, you know, like alcohol prep, stuff like that, you know, uh, we need to be able to clean these wounds, especially superficial wounds, because something as little as a scrape can cause an inf infection and cause sepsis, uh, which is a, a life-threatening infection that you get in your body. And something as simple as, you know, being able to clean that wound and flush it out is very important. Uh, water uh, or sterile water, you know, it's got a shelf life of a couple years. You can pick that up uh, at your local Walmart in little bottles. So something like that to flush out a wound is very important as well. You know, and, and uh, it's important to have, you know, like I said earlier, more than one first aid kit. You know, you want to have a kit for your car, uh, you know, because a lot of times, how I many, you know, I'm sure all of us in this room at one time or another has uh, been driving down the road and come upon a car accident or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's important to be able to not only uh, 
you know, treat yourself in these situations, but to be able to render aid to somebody else as well. Because that aid that you render may very well, you know, save that person's life. And, uh, you know, especially this day and time, uh, you know, we're learning the value of life more and more every day, you know, with uh, the sickness and illnesses going around and stuff like that. So it's important to have like a small kit in your car. And, and again, I can't stress enough, uh, you know, a tourniquet being part of that uh, kit, all right? And then, uh, you know, you could probably go out and get you like a bigger first aid kit for home. Uh, the reason why I say a bigger first aid kit, especially if you have children, uh, you're gonna use that first aid kit a lot. Uh, and if you've got a bigger one, it's gonna have more stuff in it. So you're not gonna have to go out and replace stuff as often as you would, uh, you know, a smaller one. And uh, it's very important to have that at your house uh, simply because, you know, if you have something that, uh, you know, it may take an ambulance 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on where you live or your geographical location to get to you, or it may take that long for you to drive your loved one to the hospital. And uh, it's important to be able to render that first aid, you know, before emergency services get there, or before you, you know, start traveling to the hospital. Uh, you know, we've only got a small window of time, especially in a major bleed, uh, to get these people to the hospital, get the bleeding stopped and all that. And then uh, another thing is, is like out in the wilderness, you know, you, it's easy to get out and be hiking somewhere and a severe thunderstorm just come up out of nowhere. I mean, uh, Southeastern Kentucky is notorious for it being 80 degrees one minute and then 38 and snowing or there being a thunderstorm with, uh, you know, dime-sized hail coming down on you out of nowhere. And if you're out in the woods when this happens, you know, you may be three, four miles in the woods or even further, uh, you know, where we're at now uh, in this geographical location, you know, whether you be hunting or, you know, just having a hike with your family and you get stranded and then, you know, a tree could fall on somebody or something like that and you get injured and you don't have that type of stuff, uh, you know, it could be disastrous. And, uh, you know, that's something that I can't stress upon enough is being prepared. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, when they think about being prepared, they're thinking about things such as, you know, food, uh, ways to get water, uh, stuff like that. But one thing that kind of slips the mind that I've noticed from people is, is being able to render aid to your family, to yourself or others. And uh, I think that's very important to be able to do because, like I said before, it can be the difference between life and death. Uh, so, in, you know, in that first aid kit, you know, you want to have basic items as well, stuff to stop bleeding, uh, stuff for a headache. You know, again, that can also break a fever if you were stranded out there for a day or two or something like that. Uh, stuff to clean wounds with is very important. Mm -hmm. um, an EpiPen, you know, if you got somebody that's mm -hmm. allergic to bees or has some type of food allergy, uh, you know, poison ivy grows everywhere. And I know people that actually have anaphylactic reactions from getting into that stuff. And, uh, you know, if they have that EpiPen, you know, maybe purchasing an, an additional EpiPen, if you can get your doctor to write you a prescription for it, that's important to have in that first aid kit as well. Um, also try to keep uh, Benadryl in there as well, uh, simply because it can aid in allergic reactions or, you know, if you was to get, uh, you know, mosquitoes uh, eating you up or getting to an anthill or something like that. Uh, it's going to help out with the uh, additional signs and symptoms that come with that, such as, you know, itchiness, redness, and swelling. Uh, it's good to have stuff like that. Uh, I usually try to keep some, uh, some allergy medication in my first aid kit whenever I go uh, on hikes or go up in the mountains on my four-wheeler and stuff like that, uh, simply because... You know, we, we, if we get into something like that, to, you know, you're going to be uncomfortable. And I know being uncomfortable isn't necessarily a, a life-threatening uh, condition, but it can turn into one, especially if you're allergic to something and you don't realize it. So that's another thing that I try uh, to make sure that's in these kits, uh, especially my kits. It's maybe some all-day allergy relief or Benadryl as well. And, uh, you know, the biggest concern with all this uh, first aid stuff is bleeding 
or, or even a pocket mask uh, so you can provide CPR uh, or rescue breathing for somebody in cardiac arrest. And, uh, you know, the important thing is, is having that stuff with one of your family members uh, was to get into a situation like that. So that's another thing that I would think about is maybe a pocket mask uh, as well. And then, you know, that's the basics of the first aid kit. And you can always add to that. Uh, but from my recommendations, I would never take away from that. Those are your basics, stuff to control bleeding, uh, stuff to control pain or a fever or something of that nature was to happen and stuff like that. Um, you know, and like a lot of times you'll get, you know, you'll buy a first aid kit and it'll have like some band-aids. It'll have some like two by two gauze, maybe a little bit of roller gauze. But another thing that I would add on to that is maybe some bigger bulkier dressing as I was talking about before. Uh, that's going to make the difference, you know, between saving somebody's life or and, and not. Uh, I'm a firm believer that you can never be uh, under or over prepared, you know. And then another thing that I look at maybe putting in there is maybe uh, a splint. You know, they got these roller splints called uh, Sam splints. Those things are great as well, especially if you have like a fracture, being able to Im immobilize it. It's going to save you a lot of heartache as far as pain goes, because if you're running around with a fractured arm or a fractured leg and you don't have it splinted, um, all it's going to do is it's going to move around more and it's going to hurt. And you also have the, uh, the risk of making it worse or causing it to splinter, uh, maybe even uh, you know severing an artery internally with the bones rubbing together. So. It's always good to have a splint. Now, you don't necessarily have to go out and buy a splint and keep it in your first aid kit. Uh, you know, you could take uh, sticks and put them together, tie them together with those triangular bandages I was talking about, and, and be able to splint the wound that way, or split the leg or the arm that way. And then when you have those triangular bandages, you can make what we call a, a sling and swath, where, you know, you, you tie it up into a uh, triangle, and you put your arm in it and you wrap one end around your neck and come around from the back with the other one and it holds the arm in place so it's not dangling around. And we want to try to get them up level with your heart or above because if you don't, what's going to happen is it's going to start throbbing and the pain's going to be a lot worse. So it's, it's very important that we elevate those uh, extremities if we can uh, to reduce the pain in that situation. And, uh, you know, and like I said, you don't have to go out and buy these nice fancy uh, splints that you see out at Walmart or anything like that, or even online, uh, especially in the wilderness. I mean, uh, use your resources that are around you, you know, some, some good size uh, sticks, you know, tying them up, you know, above the injury and below the injury and being able to immobilize that, uh, that leg or that arm is very important. Um, so does anybody have any questions real quick and, uh, before we move any further? If you want to, you can, uh, put them in chat, in the chat, if you have any questions for Owen, or you can, uh, uh, even, uh, unmute yourself and, and ask him, Owen, good information so far. Let's see if I can see the chat here. Don't look like, it doesn't look like there's anything that's come up in chat. Uh, don't see any, uh, anybody unmuting or anything. So if you want to go ahead to the next uh, portion, you go right ahead. Okay. So basically, you know, I did the overview of, uh, of several different things there. So I kind of want to talk about each one of them individually, such as bleeding control. Uh, I, I like to go in further about that. So uh, a couple of things that we teach in the Stop the Bleed class is, uh, you know, wound packing and such. Um, if you take, you know, you have a, a deep wound on your extremity here, okay, uh, you can actually take, you know, roller gauze or something like that if it's real deep and put it in there a little bit more, like actually stuff it in the wound. 
And basically what that's going to do is it's going to add a little bit of extra pressure into it and stop that bleeding even more. And then once you do that, you can put like a four by four bandage on it. And then you're going to wrap it around with that roller gauze I was talking about, hold direct pressure on it. And then you want to elevate it. Okay. Above your heart. And basically that what that's going to do is it's going to make it uh, to where it's going to be harder for it to, uh, to bleed anymore. And it's going to start the clotting process a lot sooner because you know, it's not flowing uh, through that extremity as it would if it was hanging down. And another thing with elevating it and holding direct pressure on it, it's also going to uh, alleviate the pain a little bit more too. You won't have the throbbing sensation. Uh, now, another thing I like to talk about as far as bleeding control also is the difference between an arterial bleeding and a venous bleeding, okay? And basically what the difference is gonna be is, is whenever you have uh, venous bleeding or your capillaries uh, bleeding, what you're gonna have is a darker blood oozing out slowly, all right? And, uh, you know, that's something that a lot of times we can stop with elevation and pressure, all right? And then as far as arterial bleeding, this blood is going to be a lot brighter and it's also, and it may be actually pulsating as your heart's beating. So, I mean, a lot, sometimes it'll actually like, you know, shoot out kind of violently. Uh, and then other times if, you know, the, the artery is inside the wound, you're just gonna see a lot of uh, bright red blood. Now, when this happens, that's whenever we want to immediately put pressure on the wound, uh, get a bandage on it. We wanna elevate it we wanna put a tourniquet on it. Now, when I talk about these tourniquets, we want these tourniquets to be tight enough to where the bleeding stops. So one thing that we want to do after we put that tourniquet on is we want to feel for a radial uh, or a distal pulse in these wounds, which means, you know, a radial pulse or a pedal pulse in your foot. And you want to make sure that that stops. All right. And that what that means is uh, you have, you know, stopped that artery from uh, letting blood flow through. And, uh, you know, basically you've stopped the bleed in that extremity. Now, a lot of times they used to teach that, you know, tourniquets was a last resort and that, you know, they cause permanent damage. And, you know, it can be true if they're on for four hours or longer uh, that you can have some issues with circulation in that extremity with the possibility of losing a limb. But, uh, you know, life over limb is something that we have to take into consideration when we're talking about stopping these bleeds. Uh, you know, you've got four hours at least uh, before some permanent damage starts happening to that extremity. But again, uh, you know, life over limb is, you know, something to take into consideration there. I would much rather be living with one less arm than dead, okay? And, and the same thing goes for our family members. You know, we want to keep them around. Uh, so that's very Im important to uh, take into consideration is, you know, being able to be trained on these things to uh, save the life of ourselves or our loved ones. Now, uh, whenever you place a tourniquet, uh, you want to place it at least two inches above the wound. All right, uh, higher, high and tight is uh, what we teach in uh, you know a lot of these trauma classes. So you know, you want to get at least two inches above, but we can go higher if we want to, and we want to stop the bleeding completely in that extremity. Uh, to be able to, uh, you know, stop that bleed because we're talking minutes uh, being bleeding out and uh, death happening. All right, another thing that uh, we want to move on to from that because that pretty much covers the bleeding portion. You know, we want to remember to elevate, uh, hold direct pressure, and then if it's an arterial bleed, we want to be able to put that tourniquet on. And like I said, we can make tourniquets out of, uh, you know, uh, we could take a shirt. At least we want to make sure it's at least an inch to two inches thick. You can take a shirt, cut it to make it fit like that, or a triangular bandage, like I said, that we need to put in our first aid kit. You want to tie a square knot, and in the middle of that square knot, you want to put you a stick or an ink pen or something like that to make a windlass to where you can uh, cinch that down real tight. And then your uh, strings or your ends that you have left hanging over. We want to tie those up around the windlass so that uh, it doesn't loosen on us, okay? So it's very important. 
another thing I want to talk about is uh, airway management. All right, that's uh, that's something that a lot of times that's not taught in a in a basic first aid class, or it's kind of just talked about for a minute and then not uh, being able to open your loved one's airway or being able to open somebody else's airway is very important as well. Uh, so there's there's two methods. There's the help chin, <laughs> the uh, head tilt chin lift. All right. Uh, sometimes I get my words mixed up, so, so I'll just look over that. All right, so basically what you want to do is you want to take two fingers at the uh, at the chin, another one at the top of the head, and basically what you're going to do is you're going to rock the head back and forward and uh, make sure that mouth is open and that's going to open the airway up, okay? And then uh, this is where you would get your pocket mask if need be if the patient's not bleeding and be able to provide rescue breasts for the patient. Uh, so that's uh, that's very important to uh, to know, you know. And, and a lot of times, you know, I've I've talked to people. Uh, I call people sometimes after you know there's a there's a cardiac arrest event, like a CPR hasn't been done or something like that. And a lot of people are just like they're scared, or they or they haven't had a CPR class, and they think because they haven't had a CPR class that they can't provide CPR or rescue breasts to these people, uh, which is actually false. Um, if you haven't had that stuff, you know, uh, you're still like covered over the, under the Good Samaritan law. So, you know, keep that in mind. Don't be afraid to render aid to somebody just because, you know, your CPR card's expired or something like that. So, you know, it's very important that we, we have a CPR mask in there as well so that we can provide those rescue breaths to somebody, especially family. Because here's the thing. With these first aid kits, more than likely, when you use them, you're either going to use them on yourself or you're going to use them on your loved ones, okay? Um, another thing that I like to talk about as well is, uh, you know, splinting we talked about a little bit, but, you know, it's very important to, uh, to splint. You can use anything. I mean, I could pick up uh, several things in the office that I'm in right now and make a splint out of it. You know, so be able to think in outside the box is very important when it comes to splinting. Uh, you know, if you're out in the woods, two sticks. You know, if, if you're in your car, uh, I got kids, so there's everything in the world in my car that I could use uh, for splinting. I've seen, uh, I went on calls before and seen people use, you know, a, a, a 20 ounce bottle, two of them and a, and a uh, you know, a rope or a 550 cord or something like that that they've had in their car or even a belt for that matter, and, uh, and splint things, you know. So, you know, yeah, a 20 ounce bottle is probably not the best thing to use, but if that's all you got, it's all you got. You know, uh, use the person's clothes if you have to. Uh, you know, that's another thing. You know, just because you don't have a big, nice first aid kit doesn't necessarily mean that you can't render first aid to somebody. Uh, I've seen people use, uh, shirts off the patient to uh, use as bandages, you know, because a lot of people's like, well, that's not sterile. Uh, and a bandage is, well, the wound that you're stopping the bleeding in isn't sterile either. You know, it's, it's going to have some type of, uh, of stuff on it. So, so think about that as well. Uh, towels, stuff like that is another thing. Um, being able to keep some comfort medications again, uh, is very important as well. Tylenol, ibuprofen, um, Benadryl, all day allergy relief medicine. Uh, let's see what else is there. Tums, you know, that, that's important as well, especially, you know, if somebody's got some type of uh, abdominal pain, you know, it may be something that they've eaten or something like that. So uh, that's a good thing to keep in your kit as well. And then, uh, I'm trying to think what else we can cover. Like I said, I had a, I had a kit that I was going to bring and actually talk about. Uh, burns, uh, that's another thing. You know, a, a good old uh, wives tell, you know, a lot of people's, you know, they've put butter on burns. We don't, we don't teach that. Uh, you know, the, the best thing you can do with that is uh, the sterile water that we was talking about or, you know, even some bottled water. I mean, let's be real, we're not going to have – stir water with us, you know, wet those bandages down. We want them good and wet. And then put those bandages on there, 
wrap them up with a with a roller gauze. We want to make sure that anything that we apply to burns is not oil based, and that it's water based. And we want to make sure that if we put bandages on it to protect the wound, that we uh, you know make sure those are damp. Uh, because if they're not damp, they're going to stick to the burn, and when they go to unwrap it, it's going to pull the hide off, and that's going to be very painful for the person. And one thing we got to remember with burns is heat is trying to escape the patient as well. So it's very important that you uh, you know wet those down because that's going to help also with not only the heat escape, but uh, being able to cut the pain down on the patient a little bit as well, okay? And then uh, we want to hydrate that patient if we can with water uh, because, you know, they're losing their body heat and their body is naturally uh, trying to push all those fluids to that burn area to try to resaturate that area because uh, that's just the body's natural way of, uh, you know, uh, dealing with that. And then another thing, uh, you know, with uh, with bleeding, I want to touch on real quick is, uh, you know, elevating the pe person's lower extremities if they're bleeding a lot is going to help, you know, maintain a blood pressure for a while if you're stuck out in the wilderness. So that's uh, that's another thing that we need to uh, to think about as well. Uh, David, can you think of anything else we need to touch on? I mean. Uh, yeah, like I said, unfortunately, I had like this whole big plan and I had stuff I was going to bring with me, but uh, we got busy at work the last little bit that I was there, so I kind of run off and forgot what I was bringing. So, does anybody have any more questions of me before we uh close out here? Any, any questions for Owen? Uh, Owen, I will have to say, uh, you, you brought about something that I thought was interesting. Uh, typically, we tend to go out and buy a first aid kit, but you continuously talked about building your own first aid kit, and it's, it's no different than building your, your own disaster preparedness kit. Uh, you can go out and buy bulk items and split it up and make two or three kits uh, two or three kits out of one, you know, one item. So I think that, I, I think that's great. Uh, what you've talked about here. Yeah, that's, that's actually what I do at my house is, you know, I've got three different vehicles at my house and then I have my house first aid kit and then I have one on all my ATVs as well. So we go out and we buy bulk items and split it up and we make, and what we do is, is we make all the kits the same. That way, regardless of what vehicle we're in, we know exactly what's in that kit, you know? So that, that's another thing is, is being able to, to build, if you build these kits yourself, you know exactly what's in them. And if you build them uniformly, by uh, uniform or all the same, it don't matter which kit you pick up, you know exactly what's in that kit. So, so that's why that I, I always tell people that it's a little better to, to build the first aid kit yourself versus going out and buy a pre-made one. Because your pre-made kits are like for your scratches and stuff like that. They don't they don't make pre-made kits that have stuff for, you know, if, if, if your family member's arm was to get cut off or something like that. And, you know, that's not something I think of just because I work on an ambulance. Um, you know, that's something I, I thought of way before uh, I was ever uh, do an EMS. That's something I kind of learned from the army, you know, uh, dealing with stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I always recommend people that they go out and they buy their stuff and build their own kits. That way everything's the same. So it don't matter what kit you got, you can reach, reach in there and you know exactly where everything is. That's great, great information. Uh, you know, uh, we, you know, the medicine has a, an expiration date on it. Uh, do, does there, is there anything else that we need to look at uh, as, you know, towards an expiration date that we need to date or make sure that we change that out regularly? Uh, well, what I do is I like to go, a lot of times you can find on sale, like in the, uh, in the trap, you know, the travel section of these stores, it's got like travel, uh, you know, shaving cream and stuff like this. A lot of times you can find like the little packets of travel Tylenol and stuff like that. So usually what I do with mine is I buy that and then I take a Sharpie and I make the expiration date real big on it. And uh, I actually go as far as, you know, uh, a lot of the bag, you can buy the small bags like a, 
like a shaving bag, for example. And a lot of them's got the little thing for your name card. And what I do is I take a, like a, you know, you can go to any gas station and find a bunch of business cards laying around. And like, I'll grab a few of those business cards and then I'll write down the medication that I have in my bag and I'll write the expiration date on it so that I can look at it real quick through that little card holder. And I know exactly, well, this is expired. I need to go replace it. You know, so yeah, if, if something's expired, uh, you know, I can't tell you that to go and take that medication after it's expired. I mean, it's, uh, you know, if it's expired, it needs to be changed, you know, because a lot of times it loses its potency and stuff like that. And then also another thing you got to think of with expiration dates is the packaging. A lot of times with stuff that's like uh, travel size or single dose, uh, that packaging is sterile on the inside. And a lot of times the actual expiration date may not be for the medication itself. It may actually be for the packaging that it's in to keep it sterile. You know, so we don't want to put, you know, any medication that we possibly think, uh, you know, has been exposed to any type of elements into our bodies. So that's, that's one reason why I stress on expiration dates like that. Okay, great. That's, that's great information. And, uh, you know, I will say, you know, what you mentioned with the tourniquets, you know, that's something we really never think of, you know, and when you go and buy a first aid kit that has a tourniquet in it, it gets expensive. I'm sorry, you cut out there. I, I didn't copy that last part. The, the, the tourniquet, that's a great, uh, that's a great item. Oh, yeah. You know, there's not an expiration date on tourniquets. You know, that's, uh, that's a good thing. And uh, I think it's uh, very important that we, uh, that we add that to our kits. Being able to stop an arterial bleed is the difference between life and death. And, you know, when I look at my, my 10-year-old daughter or I look at my, uh, my newborn son, uh, you know, they're, they're irreplaceable. You know, uh, my mother is irreplaceable. My girlfriend is irreplaceable. And, uh, you know, a 25 to $30 purchase of a really good tourniquet, which I recommend the cat tourniquet. You can Google it by that. Uh, you know, it's simple to put on. It's quick and easy. And if I spend that, I spent $30 on the most stupid stuff before. Uh, $30 on a life-saving piece of equipment that I may or may not use, but if I have to use, I know it's going to save my loved one's life. It's priceless. Definitely. Great, great stuff there. Definitely. Any, any questions, any comments for, for Owen or David? We got David in the background as well. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, you, you can take anything to use as a tourniquet. Uh, I've seen you in the chat there and, uh, you know, a t-shirt. But one thing I like about these uh, pre-made tourniquets or, or manufactured tourniquets is, you, you know, they need to be out of the packaging. As soon as you buy it, you need to take it out of the packaging and have it set up. So all you got to do is unfold it. It's ready. You put it on. And all you got to do is pull a strap and it's Velcro. And you Velcro it and then you turn that windlass two or three times until the pull stops. And then it's got a place that holds it. And then you take a Velcro and put over it and write the time down. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what makes it so simple. Uh, you know, I don't have stock in the company or nothing, but I, you know, I've, I've used them in combat when I was in Iraq and, uh, you know, I've, I've seen it save lives. So that's why I preach the cat tourniquet like I do is because I've seen it in action. I've used it on the ambulance. I've used it, you know, in combat and, and I know it works. And I've also made tourniquets out of, you know, uh, roller gauze and stuff like that and it's worked wonderfully as well but uh, the simplicity of being able to put that tourniquet on cinch it down tighten it up and be done with it uh you know seconds matter in arterial bleeds uh do bandages and gauze have gauze have a shelf life okay the answer to that as far as the bandaging goes no the packaging uh does have expiration dates on some things that's something you'll have to look at. And basically that's just to, uh, you know, make sure that the packaging are, is sterile. Okay. Now, uh, have I, you know, never on the ambulance have I ever used anything expired, but as far as 
my personal stuff have I used stuff expired on uh, you know as far as bandaging goes on my family absolutely because here's here's the thing you got to think of when bleeding happens uh, once something cuts that it's not a sterile wound anymore even though your blood is is oozing out of it it's not sterile it's dirty so you know as, as far as bandaging goes I wouldn't really worry about it but I'm not going to say you know tell you to go out and still use it I'm just saying me personally I wouldn't worry about it but uh, I would recommend replacing it if it has an expiration date and it's expired good question good question anybody else All right, great, great information there, uh, Owen. We really appreciate it. And uh, while I'm thinking of it, I want to say uh, Friday's Patriots Day. And uh, Owen and David, thank you all so much for everything you do. We, we truly appreciate it. I appreciate you guys for having me. I've, uh, I'm honored with the uh, experience to be here for you guys. And uh, I see the sun setting on the west side of the courthouse. So, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, it looks like you got a lot of kudos there. We appreciate y'all coming in and making things happen tonight. Uh, sorry, I'm not. Uh, I'm not to where uh, I've got a landline, so to speak. Uh, so I'm probably breaking up a little bit. But uh, really appreciate everybody coming on tonight. Uh, Thursday night, uh, we have Lynette Hutchinson. Uh, Lynette is the fire chief at the Harlan uh, City Fire Department, and she's going to be talking about um, fire safety in the home. Any questions, comments, Shad, or Phil? No, oh, well done. Yes, it was great. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. So that's what we have for. Uh, did, did the Thursday announcement come through clear? It yes. Is. We heard All you. right. Good deal. Good deal. <laughs> uh, well, folks, I tell you what, uh, Owen, David, thank you all very much for uh, for your help this evening. We sure, sure appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody on Thursday. See you well, on Thursday. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you, Owen. Everybody have a great evening.